Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. This video is the next in a series looking at the financial implications of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on the global economy. And in today's episode, I want to talk about oil and specifically the shipping of oil. If you've been following the channel, you'll know that following Russia's invasion, all of the West came out and applied sanctions against Russia. And there is now a concerted effort to reduce the amount of oil that's being purchased from Russia. Now, that hasn't been a complete embargo because a lot of countries are dependent on that oil. So we're seeing a gradual change. Countries are reducing the amount of oil that they're buying. And one of the key questions is whether or not India and China will be able to step in and buy up all of the Russian oil that's no longer being bought by the West. And if that does happen, then that would work well for Russia because they would still have a market for all of their oil. If they have problems selling into China and Russia, then that would cause major issues for Russia because if you can't keep pumping oil at the same rates, then that's going to affect your drilling and your wells because there's just nowhere to store it. So one question is whether or not there are enough tankers in the world to be able to cope with the logistics of the changes to the supply chain because Russia is currently piping a lot of oil directly into Europe. So a lot more ships would need to be loaded up to move it to India and China. But at the same time, we're also going to see an increase in demand for shipping to move more oil from the Middle East and the USA to Europe. And that's why recently we've seen a big increase in shipping costs and freight costs and older vessels are being used for longer. But the biggest challenge that Russia faces right now is insurance. Because when you move oil in tankers, it has to be fully insured. We've all seen pictures of oil disasters if a tanker does get into difficulty, if it sinks and the oil leaks into the ocean, it costs tens of billions to put that situation right. So you need to have comprehensive insurance and shipping insurance is a very specialist area. It's a long-standing industry and it's dominated by the West. So that is one of the key issues. Now, as you might be aware, since the start of the war in Ukraine, the amount of oil that's being moved to India and China has increased dramatically. And that's predominantly because Russia has been offering massive discounts. They've been offering somewhere in the region of $30 per barrel discount for those markets. And so that's a very attractive deal for India and China. So ships have been moving large quantities of oil. And this is at the same time as the West has introduced sanctions on all of the insurance. And it's now transpired that Russia is providing the insurance for that shipping. So in today's video, I want to go through exactly what the insurance requirements are, how the insurance industry is structured, and that includes what's called reinsurance. We'll then have a look at one of the most famous oil shipping disasters. I'll talk about shipping certification and how Russia has managed to bypass those issues. And then we'll talk about the Russian insurers who are providing all of this cover. And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summaries to what I think the risks are here and what the potential outcome is over the next three to six months. So before we get into all of that, if I could ask you for a thumbs up at some point during this video, if you're enjoying the content and also to subscribe if you haven't done so already. Don't forget, I always include chapters in these videos. And if you'd like to support the channel, please have a look below where you'll find links to YouTube, super thanks and membership, as well as buy me a coffee and Patreon. And I'm delighted to tell you that today's video is brought to you in conjunction with Masterworks. All ships require certification confirming that they're safe and seaworthy in order to gain insurance and also to get access to ports. If you don't have a certificate, then nobody is going to let you dock in their port and also it invalidates your insurance. And this is an area that's a problem for Russia because certification is dominated by Western companies and all of those companies have been party to the sanctions. And so for the last few months, Russian ships have been unable to get certification from the usual providers. As I mentioned at the start of the video, Russia has been shipping large quantities of oil to India and the certification that's required for those ships has been provided by a Dubai company. India is providing safety certification for dozens of ships managed by a Dubai subsidiary of a top Russian shipping group, Sovkomflot, which is enabling oil exports to be made to India after Western certifiers withdrew their services due to global sanctions against Russia. Certification by Indian Register of Shipping, one of the world's top classification companies, provides a final link in the paperwork chain needed to keep the tanker fleet afloat and delivering Russian crude oil to overseas markets. Data shows that more than 80 ships have now been certified by SCF Management Services Dubai Limited, a Dubai-based entity which is a subsidiary of Somcomflot. Shipping industry publication Tradewinds has reported that most of Somcomflot's international tanker fleet was declassified due to sanctions, but has now been transferred to the IR class, meaning that they can sail again. 
Ship certification is ruled by the International Association of Classification Societies, which accounts for more than 90% of the world's cargo carrying tonnage. The Russian Maritime Register of Shipping was previously part of this group until March when its membership was withdrawn following a vote by 75% of members. Membership of the association sets technical standards which typically make a certifier more attractive for insurers, ports, flag registries and ship owners seeking safety assurances. The four leading members which derive from the UK, Norway, France and the United States have all stopped services to Russian companies due to sanctions. When asked about the certification data for Somkop's fleet, a spokesperson for IR Class responded, Indian Register of Shipping, as an international ship classification society, reiterates that we have not classed vessels which are owned, flagged or managed by Russian companies. The spokesperson declined to comment further on the matter, including on the Dubai unit's connection to its Russian parents. Sovconflot is subject to sanctions and other restrictions by the UK and the European Union, while the US has restricted its financial activities. So what we're seeing here is a classic loophole situation. Although everybody is saying they don't want to deal with Russia and Russian ships can no longer be certified, because we've got a Dubai subsidiary of a Russian company, the officials involved here are saying that this is a Dubai company. They're not looking at who actually owns the Dubai company. So it is actually crazy. If you're applying sanctions against Russia, then it should apply to all subsidiaries of Russian companies because essentially it's the same thing. Just because the company is registered in Dubai doesn't mean that it's a Dubai entity and it's completely independent. If it's owned by Sovconflot, then clearly it's part of Russia and therefore should be subject to the sanctions. But everybody's turning a blind eye to this and India's happy to take those deliveries because the oil is significantly cheaper than it is from everyone else. As with all other forms of transport, shipping requires comprehensive insurance. You need to put insurance in place for a variety of reasons. Firstly, you need to protect any damage to your ship but also any damage to a port or any other physical object that your ship could run into. You also need insurance in terms of your crew. But one of the key things for an oil tanker is that you need insurance to cover the eventuality of some form of environmental disaster. If your ship springs a leak for some reason and starts leaking huge volumes of oil into the ocean, somebody is going to have to pay to clear all of that up and you will be liable. So therefore you need comprehensive insurance in the event of some sort of disaster hitting your ship because these things are incredibly expensive to sort out. And in international waters, you'll be entirely liable for any damage and costs associated to that damage. The insurance market for shipping has been built up over a very long period and is dominated by a small number of players. And maintaining sufficient insurance to be able to transport the largest volumes of oil amongst any country in the world is potentially going to be a massive issue for Russia going forward. Insurance is a very specialist field where you need to know what you're doing, you need to be able to assess your risks, and you need to be able to spread that risk. Because no single insurer wants to take multi-billion dollar risk on one particular event happening. And that's why the concept of reinsurance was developed in the market, to enable individual insurance companies to offload risk above a certain limit. And this chart shows how the reinsurance structure has been built up for shipping insurance. And essentially what this shows is that all of the insurance companies in this group have the ability to offload excess risk to the other parties. So in the event of having a very large claim being more than $100 million, they won't take a single hit on that. They'll be able to look to the other parties who will share that risk. And when you're looking at something like the Deepwater Horizon oil rig disaster, which cost $65 billion, there is no way on earth as an insurance company that you can take that sort of risk. It's impossible. It would put you out of business in the blink of an eye. So the market therefore relies upon the collective risk spreading agreement that's been built up over a very long period of time. Today, all investors face a dilemma. Inflation is at its highest level for 40 years and the Fed is going through its most aggressive phase of money tightening ever. Top firms are predicting returns of less than 5% through to 2035 and restructuring your portfolio has never been more difficult or challenging. So where can you turn? What sort of assets are available? 
JP Morgan recently advised that alternative assets were something that seriously needed to be considered. And one thing that's caught my eye in terms of alternative assets is Masterworks. Masterworks has solidified itself as the platform for investing in contemporary art. Masterworks enables you to access exclusive art from the likes of Banksy and Monet for a fraction of the price paid for by billionaires for such pieces. Roughly two thirds of all billionaires allocate between 10 and 30% of their total portfolio to art, partly to diversify and partly to provide a natural hedge against inflation. And that makes sense because between 1995 and 2021, contemporary art outstripped the S&P index by 164%. And art has also exhibited the lowest correlation to equities of any single asset class. So if you believe that the equity markets are on the way down, then this could be an asset class worth considering. Since inception, Masterworks have sold three artworks, all of which provided a return of over 30% to investors' net of fees. As with all investments, there is no guarantee that past performance is an indication of future success. So you need to do your own research here. But if you are interested in Masterworks and you'd like to support the Joe Blogs channel, then you can skip the waitlist by clicking in the link in the description below. Russian state-run Sovkomflot has insured all its cargo ships with Russian insurers and the cover meets international rules, the chief executive said, after Western insurers withdrew cover. Technically, we meet all international trade requirements. Currently, the company's fleet is fully busy delivering oil and other cargoes to different parts of the world. In terms of offloading the risk, it's been announced that state-controlled Russian National Reinsurance Company is now the main reinsurer of Russian ships, including all of Sovkomflot's fleet. Russia's central bank has raised the reinsurance company's capital to 300 billion rubles, which is 5 billion US dollars, from 71 billion, and hiked its guaranteed capital to 750 billion rubles, which is around 12 billion dollars, so the firm had adequate resources to provide reinsurance. The increase in authorised capital will give Russian insurers wider opportunities to reinsure risks inside Russia, build additional reinsurance capacities and manage new sanctions risk, it said in a report. According to its website, the company now offers P&I reinsurance of up to $1 billion. Western insurers typically have higher capital allocations with allotments for different types of cover, such as marine insurance, which provides the full range of protection for ships. A source from a Western insurance company said, I imagine the capital of RNCR is not purely marine and could be burned through really quickly. Most Russian oil exports, in particular those of Sovkomflot tankers, are bound for Asian ports, mainly in India and China. Indian authorities have already accredited the Russian insurance for shipping oil, which means vessels the company insures can enter Indian ports. The Exxon Valdez was an oil tanker owned by Exxon Shipping Company. On the 23rd of March 1989, the Exxon Valdez left the port of Valdez in Alaska and was bound for Long Beach, California and reportedly had 53 million gallons of crude oil on board. Just after midnight on March the 24th, the ship struck a reef in Alaska's Prince William Sound. The impact of the collision tore open the ship's hull, causing 11 million gallons of crude oil to spill into the water. At the time, it was the largest single oil spill in US waters. Initial attempts to contain the oil failed, and in the months that followed, the oil slick spread, eventually covering 1,300 miles of coastline. Investigators later discovered that the captain of the Exxon Valdez had been drinking at the time and had allowed an unlicensed third mate to steer the massive ship. Exxon eventually paid around $2 billion in cleanup costs and a further $1.8 billion for habitat restoration and personal damages related to the spill. Prior to this disaster, Prince William Sound had been a pristine wilderness, and it's estimated that this oil spill killed 250,000 seabirds, 3,000 otters, 300 seals, 250 bald eagles, and 22 killer whales. It also played a major role in the collapse of salmon and herring fisheries in Prince William Sound in the early 90s. Fishermen went bankrupt and the economies of small shoreline towns, including Valdez and Cordova, suffered in the following years. Estimates of the potential economic loss as a direct result of this oil spill were as much as $2.8 billion. 
So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video because the shipping of oil is one of the key issues that we're looking at with regards to the sanctions. It's clear that India and China are happy to buy oil at reduced rates. They both have a population of over 1.4 billion and a large demand for oil. They're both net importers of oil. And they've both remained relatively neutral with regards to what's going on in Ukraine. So there is demand. And one of the issues for Russia was how do we actually ship this oil if all of the West have banned us from any insurance contracts because we need insurance to be able to put those ships onto the water. So the obvious solution was always going to be that Russia was going to do its own insurance. It will provide full cover. Now the risk here is really quite large because what we saw earlier when I showed you the Exxon Valdez disaster, you can see how damaging an oil leak is. And it's really difficult and really expensive to be able to clean that up. And that's why we have the concept of reinsurance. One individual insurance company does not want to take the full risk on a tanker going down because it would put that company out of business. So reinsurance is a way of spreading the risk. Everybody takes a little piece of the pie. And if the disaster does occur, then it's manageable. The fact that Russia are taking on all of the insurance and all of the reinsurance is a waste of time. Essentially, this makes a nonsense of the concept of reinsurance. The idea of reinsurance is that lots of different companies and countries around the world spread the risk so that that means that everybody can cope. If Russia is reinsuring its own insurance, then essentially Russia is taking 100% of the risk on all of those ships that are going onto the ocean. And it only takes one of them to go down to have a really big claim. If they had multiple ships going down, which is a complete possibility, these things happen. It's very difficult to know what's going to happen with an oil tanker. And the volume of oil that Russia is looking to move backwards and forwards to India and China is really large. If you think about the current infrastructure, Russia is currently piping a lot of oil directly to Europe. So it's in contained areas. Moving it backwards and forwards onto ships is going to increase the risk. And as I mentioned earlier in the video, because there's been a massive demand for shipping, and that's likely to continue over the next 12 to 24 months, older ships are now being kept in service for longer. And that increases the risk as well, because if you've got an older vessel, there is more chance of it springing a leak or getting into difficulty or sinking. So Russia is placing a big bet on all of these ships. And one of the concerns I think globally is if we do see an environmental disaster, Will it be cleaned up sufficiently? Will Russia actually follow through and pay for this insurance? It's one thing saying we will insure these ships so that they're allowed to go in and out of Indian and Chinese ports. But if we do see some form of disaster, will Russia actually pay up? Will they hand over the money? And if they don't, then who's going to pay for that? And the answer to that is obviously everybody else because the cleanup will need to be done. We don't know where a disaster will strike, but nobody wants to see the oceans full of oil, to see lots of animals and wildlife dying because they're choking on hydrocarbons. So it will get cleaned up, but the question is whether or not the insurance will ever pay out. And if we do have a situation like that and Russia doesn't pay up, then that would mark the end of the Russian oil business. So Russia will be in a very difficult situation if that does occur. Now, I'm not really one for conspiracy theories and forecasting what might happen, but I'm sure a lot of the Western nations are looking at what's happening right now with regards to this shipment of oil and Russia deciding that it's going to take all the risk on these tankers. And it will be a very interesting situation if one of these tankers does spring a leak for whatever reason, whether that be an accident or foul play. Because if that did happen in an Indian port or a Chinese port, it would be chaos and would definitely damage the relationship between India, China and Russia. That's pretty unlikely, but I thought it was worth raising the issue because it's an interesting point. Russia is making a really big bet on itself right now. And if something goes wrong, they're going to be in a world of pain from an insurance and cost point of view. So in the normal course of events, this would not happen. You would never get one country providing all the insurance and the reinsurance for what it's worth on all of its oil ships. It's crazy. It's too big a risk. It's too big a gamble. That's why the insurance market has grown up over a long period of time. And that's why everybody shares the risk because it's far too damaging. If you have one disaster, it can wipe you out. And if that does happen, then it's going to be really interesting to see how Russia copes with it. So hopefully you found today's video useful, informative and educational. If you've liked what I've said today, then please give me that thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this.